Good evening, good evening, good evening. <clears throat> Tonight, Plato's Symposium. Now you're all familiar with Plato's Symposium. Therefore, I would like to take it in a different way. I would like to proceed through the steps, what kinds of steps there are that leads to a vision, the vision of the nature <clears throat> of reality. From it comes an interesting challenge and a new beginning, and therefore I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to work backwards. Curious, very curious what we're going to be doing tonight. And uh, <clears throat> with a piece of chalk and a blackboard, we can do anything. So I would like, therefore, to start with the challenge and the new beginning. <clears throat> now, we'll go over this later, but essentially, he has, Plato has two descriptions of the steps, a brief form and a more extended exploration of the steps or the stages. In any case, it culminates in a vision which is available only to the mind, the mind only. And that vision, therefore, is of the nature of ultimate reality. Now, how is it how is it experienced and what name you give it are two different things. What one encounters is what is called the perfection of beauty. That's it. <clears throat> Sometimes called beauty itself. A wonder is beauty. that by an interesting kind of reflection and perception, they coincide. The only thing proper to call it is the nature of reality. Now, I'd like to get into the challenge and the new beginning. Now, Socrates is relating this great speech on the nature of beauty in a speech which is the way he structures it as a recollection from his teacher, Diotima. So Diotima of Mantinea is his teacher, and he's recollecting this entire speech he's giving before his friends. And it is her, it is her communication to him that forms the substance of this entire speech. But in it is a very, very curious statement which I'm going to share with you. Just as these steps can be looked at either in full and brief form, so she also gives an account of this very stages in terms of what it's like to relate between student and teacher. She is the teacher. He, the student. Socrates is recollecting the entire speech, presumably back from his early days. It's the way she describes their relationship that is most interesting that I would like to get into because behind it then comes a new beginning. The stages themselves are cut. You can cut it right in half. The first part is the physical. The second part deals with 
reflections on the nature of society and therefore it becomes more and more into the realm of the mind. So it's physical versus entering into understanding different kinds of beauty. <clears throat> now, the brief, brief description of this is very simple. She then gives the discussion of this entire vision, going step by step up these steps. And she describes that. And then she compacts it into a very brief statement of maybe four or five steps, and that's all. I'd like to start with that. Right. The first is, first, all right, what must happen? You must love one body. Physical. Then, second step, two or more. Then it moves into the mind. Now you must now seek to, dis to understand the beauty and pursuits and customs of our people. And then it leaves the physical realm. Now, I would like to leave this exploration just with a literal statement of what's going on in his account of the student-teacher relationship because it doesn't pick up here into the realm of the mind. It picks up right from here. Therefore, I thought I'd read it to you. And therefore, we can see the psychological aspect of it as well as the physical side to it, as it proceeds through these stages. Now, for those who are interested in following this up, this is called 209B, the Stephanus numbering system. <clears throat> Now, when a person is seeking beauty itself, I have to add an important detail. And that is they are said to be pregnant in their soul. Right. And there, of course, is a beautiful picture of a pregnant soul. Right. For those of you who aren't familiar with pregnant souls. Those who, are, those who are involved in this kind of pursuit, right, it is assumed that they already are pregnant in their soul and they're seeking somewhere and somehow to beget it. There is something in the soul that must be born, that must be begotten, and therefore later must be raised as well as nurtured and raised. <clears throat> That's what's curious about this work. So then, let me read for you, all right? Well, that would be different than someone that's seeking Pardon, beauty. Louder, please. That would be different than someone that's seeking beauty. All men? That means even those that aren't seeking. Well, all men seek beauty. Different than those that have a divinity in them and are pregnant from their youth. That's a different class. All right, that's a different class. I can go into the differences later if you'd like but that's a different class. Watch the way he starts this. He picks up this theme of divinity in one, and you can follow it with me. So again, a man with divinity in him, whose soul from his youth is pregnant with these things, desires when he grows up to beget and procreate. And thereupon, I think, he seeks and goes about to find the beautiful thing in which he can beget, for in the ugly he never will. Being pregnant then, he welcomes bodies which are beautiful rather than ugly. And if he finds a soul beautiful, generous, well-bred, he gladly welcomes the two, body and soul, together. 
both, all right, body and soul together. <clears throat> and for a human being like that, he has plenty of talks about virtue or excellence and what the good man ought to be and to practice, and he tries to educate him. For by <clears throat> attaching himself to a person of beauty, I think, and keeping company with him, he begets and procreates what he has been long been pregnant with. Present and absent, he remembers him. <clears throat> And with him fosters what is begotten. So that as a result, these people maintain a much closer communion together and a firmer friendship than parents of children because they've shared between them children more beautiful and more immortal. And everyone would be content to have such children born to him rather than human children. He would look to Homer and Hesiod and the other good poets and wish to rival them. Oh, okay. From this relationship, from this relationship, there's a cultivation going on, and what the person was pregnant with can finally emerge. That child, as it were, metaphorically speaking, can be said then to rival both Homer and Hesiod the religious or the spiritual writings of the Greeks of that age. This child of this relationship is going to rival, compete against, rival against the religious teachings of the age. Or spiritual teachings or religious teachings, in this case, Homer and Hesiod. Let me go back over that. Socrates is recounting a dialogue that he had <clears throat> over a certain length of time with Diotima, his teacher. He's recalling it step by step. He's recalling the fact that Diotima said that there is going to be this kind of relationship that's possible and if it is, and if it does culminate in a, in a birth, a child, it's going to be a kind of philosophical child, and it will rival Homer and Hesiod. Let's change it. Let's change it to contemporary things. The Bible and the Quran. That would be contemporary. What would that then be saying? That Diotima, through Socrates, believes that the kind of relationship that they are going to have, since it's in the early days, that kind of relationship, if it brings, its, if it brings to fruition what has been developing, what emerges from that is going to be an interesting thing not a human child, but a child, which then can compete with the Bible and the Koran or Homer and Hesiod. There are not many people today who are in Hesiod and going around the streets knocking on your door to be saved by reading Hesiod. And there aren't too many who do that with Homer. But this was written at the time when the great tradition was going on, where this was a vital, vibrant religious inspired movement in the Hellenic age. And at the time it was going on, Plato or Socrates is looking at it and saying what we are doing here will produce something that will rival these.
That is to say, Diotima and Socrates may, if everything works out according to the plan, the pursuit, she may be able to help him, bring him to the point where he can then be open enough to have this experience into the nature of reality, which is the perfection of beauty or beauty itself. And that will provide a way of understanding human nature and our culture in such a way that you can use it as steps to a vision. Before he finished, in terms of the speech, before he had the culminating vision, she's telling him what may yet occur. Therefore, this is prophetic because today the symposium still is functioning and for some Platonists that is still seen this way. Now, that's the challenge and that's a new beginning. Plato is setting out a new beginning. This is a new kind of philosophy and it's still as new as it was then. And therefore these steps are there for those who want to run up it and take a look and have this confirming vision so they can then confirm every aspect of it. Now, as I say, let's go back through it now. I'm starting from the challenge and the new beginning. That's where it's going. The brief form, as we said before, loving one body, loving a couple of bodies, finding the beauty in these. This is a physical. The only thing similar to this that we know of is in the Tantra game, where physical beauty is part of the entire spiritual tradition. He's saying you must discover beauty most intimately again and again and bring that up. No rejection, no repression. You're not going to exclude it. You're not going to condemn it. You're going to, though, continue to go up through the entire pursuit wherever you find beauty. Now, to reach this stage, a new kind of activity emerges, and that is the need for contemplation. That's the dividing line. He has to learn contemplation on two levels. Now, when one then moves from the physical into the realm of the mind, the role of contemplation is stressed twice. Why is it so stressed? Because this is something that is only seen with and by the mind and therefore the mind has to be prepared and cultivated for the vision. That's what this is. The mind is cultivated through beauty. Through beauty, the experience of beauty. On the physical, all the way up. And the entire, the entire pursuit has one goal. This entire thing must be done only for the sake of which only for beauty, that for the sake of which this entire journey is taken, for vision. When it is achieved, that's when Socrates in the speech says, that's when man will find life worth living for man while he contemplates beauty itself. In that contemplation, mind, intellect, that alone can see it. In that vision of beauty, which we can describe in a few minutes, you can see why he calls it reality. Perhaps one of the biggest problems in today's world of philosophy and metaphysics is this word, being. A very curious word. It takes various forms. But what he touches is the nature of reality. That's being. 
Being is then experienced as pure beauty, the perfection of beauty. That's different than modern European thought and how they use this word being. This is Platonic. It's not German. It's not European. Because once you reach that stage, something emerges that is extremely important for the philosopher, for no one else. You see, out of this experience, it is not... It may be a cultivating vision, a culminating vision, a cultivated culminating vision, but there's something behind it and beyond it. Because from that, he gives birth to another birth. There are four kinds of birth in this speech. He gives birth to real excellence, sometimes called virtue. He gives birth to real excellence, and it must then be brought up. It must be nurtured and developed. So, see, if it were an ultimate experience or the final state for man, then you don't have to do anything more with it. It should be the end. This is not. You have to do something with it. Something that emerges from this experience of the nature of ultimate reality is beauty. Something emerges from it. That's real excellence. And what do you have to do with it? You have to bring it up. And Plato in the Republic, which I think we'll go to tonight, talks about the same thing in other language, very similar, and we can then use it to highlight this so that we can see it better. Now, what do you get when you do this? Well, the end of it then is that the person, the individual, becomes a friend of God and immortal if any man ever is, is the way that's quoted. There's a vision. It's known only by the mind. It must be cultivated. There must be a practice to cultivate it, prepare it for the culminating vision. The culminating vision is, a na uh, is of the nature of beauty itself. And through that, one recognizes that's the nature of reality. Out of it emerges something. Remember we said before, a child? This is another kind of child, you see. There's a real excellence that emerges from it, and it must be brought up just like a child must be brought up. Same language. Now, let's see if we can now take a look at the four kinds of begetting and coming to birth that is mentioned in this speech of Socrates. <clears throat> now, I have to keep in mind there are four. We jumped to the last one a moment ago, and that's a fun one, of course, but I'd like to review these four. They're intimately connected with the stages. So therefore, I'm now going to read the stages in the, in the extended form rather than in this brief form. And highlight when he uses this wonderful term, begetting, a different kind, four kinds of begetting. All right, it starts on a physical plane. These are some of the mysteries of love, Socrates, in which perhaps even you may become an initiate. But as far as the higher revelations which initiation leads to if one approaches in the right way, I do not know if you could ever become an adept. At least I will instruct you. And no pains will be lacking. You try to follow if you can. It is necessary that one who approaches in the right way should begin his business young and approach beautiful bodies. First, if his leader leads aright, he should love one body and there beget beautiful speech, first begetting. Then he should take notice that the beauty in one body is akin to the beauty in another body. Let's draw something from your experiences. And if we must pursue beauty in essence, it is great folly not to believe that the beauty in all such bodies is one and the same. When he's learnt this, he must become the lover of all beautiful bodies and relax the intense passion for one, thinking lightly of it and believing it to be a small thing. Next, 
You must believe beauty in souls to be more precious than beauty in the body, so that if anyone is decent in soul, even if it has little bloom, little bloom, it should be enough for him to love and care for and to beget and to seek such talks as will make young people better. Second kind of begetting. That he may, moreover, be compelled to contemplate the beauty in our pursuits and customs. All right? So that's the second kind. Right? That's the second kind. And as a consequence, then he must be compelled, right? Compelled to contemplate our pursuits and customs. He's now directing his attention at society, at what's going on around him. And he's then required to discover the beauty that's manifest in customs and in pursuits and see the beauty there, find it in another thing. Then next, and to see that beauty is one and of the same kin, so that he may believe that uh, b bodily beauty is a small thing. Next, he must be led from practice to knowledge, that he may see again the beauty in different kinds of knowledge. All right. Again, what is it? He has to see the beauty in different kinds of knowledge. We don't want our student merely to learn things. They have to demonstrate they can see the beauty in whatever it is they think they know. Right? A much more interesting test. Right? What have you studied? Can you tell me the beauty you've discovered in mathematics and history and language? That's what's required. You have to discover the beauty in whatever it is you're using your mind for and at. Let me go back over that. Next, he must be led from practice to knowledge that he may see again the beauty in different kinds of knowledge. And directing his gaze from now on towards beauty as a whole, he may no longer dwell upon one like a servant content with the beauty of one boy or one human being or one pursuit and so be slavish and petty. But he should turn to the great ocean of beauty and in contemplation of it, give birth to many beautiful and magnificent speeches and thoughts in the abundance of philosophy. There we have the third. Very interesting kind. Third kind of beginning. Out of all of this experience of beauty on all of these levels, especially the pursuits and customs of his people and the different kinds of learnings, the different kinds of knowledge and beauty and all of them, he now must create beautiful and magnificent speeches and thoughts in the abundance of philosophy. For what purpose? Hey, he gains strength and he grows. He gains strength and he grows. Because to have this vision has quite an impact on the human psyche or the, the entire being of man. You must be prepared for it. You must have this strength. You must have grown in order to endure it. Because this is a vision of beauty itself. Powerful, powerful as it is. Probably the most powerful thing there is. And therefore to withstand it and to participate in it and get into it, this is the requirement. Because giving beautiful speeches, magnificent speeches and thoughts in the abundance of philosophy, to Socrates, this is how you gain strength for the vision. Therefore, this is a, a, a growing, a growth. <clears throat> for what purpose? That he may catch sight of some one knowledge, that one knowledge which we are now going to describe. That's the third kind of begetting. One, two, notice how it moves. Beautiful speech. Such talks as will make young people better. Certain kind of talking can only do that. And now for himself gains strength and grows. Fourth kind, we touched on that before. Right? We're out of the vision of beauty itself. One brings to birth real excellence and brings it up, nurtures it. Well, what is this step after seeking beauty and different kinds of knowledge. Right? That's this one. 
He has to turn to that great ocean of beauty and contemplate it because he's been seeing beauty everywhere. So now he can then pull it together under one metaphor, ocean of beauty. Let me read it. Back up for a little bit first. But he should turn to that great ocean of beauty and in contemplation of it give birth to many beautiful and magnificent speeches and thoughts in the abundance of philosophy until being strengthened and grown therein. He may catch sight of some one knowledge. He may catch sight of some one knowledge, the one knowledge or science of this beauty now to be described. This vision is a vision that he calls, that's this, the one knowledge. That's being. And now he has to describe it. In the description, we will get all of the terms, which when we pull together is, is the same description as being or ontos. And let's do that now. <clears throat> Whoever shall be guided so far towards the mystery of love by contemplating beautiful things rightly in due order is approaching the last grade. Suddenly he will behold the beauty marvelous in its nature, that very beauty, Socrates, for the sake of which all the earlier hardships have been born. In the first place, everlasting. Watch these terms, right? Everlasting. <clears throat> neither being born nor perishing neither increasing or diminishing constant No variations, no increase, no decrease anywhere in this vision. Not beautiful here and ugly there permeates all with a constant quality. Not beautiful now and ugly then permeates all, therefore it permeates all space and time. Not beautiful in one direction and ugly in another direction, nor beautiful in one place and ugly in another place. And then negatives. This is not, this is not physical. It's not an idea. It's not inherent in anything. It is solely beauty by itself, in itself, for itself. All beautiful things elsewhere partake of this beauty in such a manner that when they are born and perish, it becomes neither less nor more, and nothing at all happens to it. Now when you take these terms together, that's immortal, constant, no variations, no place where it's not, right? beyond space and time in that sense there are no boundaries in either. So let me quickly jump to uh, um, Republic for a moment, give you another case of the same thing.
the real lover of knowledge. What's this called? This is called knowledge. This is the object of knowledge for Plato. It's nothing else. This is the object of knowledge. Then will it not be our reasonable defense that the real lover of knowledge by his nature strives towards real being? And it's not content to abide by this multitude of things which exist only in opinion. Forwards, he goes, always. And he is never blunted, never ceases from that love, until he grasps the nature of that which really is. By that part of the soul which it belongs to grasp such a thing. For mind alone can, the only thing that can see this. Then going in, see, then going in unto this and mingling and mingling with the real, right? Going in this, right? Mingling in that with the real, he then begets noose, intellect, and truth. And in Plato, you reach truth, it's necessary, it is necessary that you must have simultaneously have reached reality or being. He then, he would know and truly live and be nourished, all of the same language we've been using up to this point, and so he would cease from his travail, but never before. Same thing, Republic. Symposium. So therefore, he's going to turn to that great ocean of beauty and in contemplation of it, right? Suddenly, that's always the major term used to describe this. You can't anticipate when it comes. It comes of its own its own time scale. Whammo, the person has the experience. This is the language to describe it. These are the consequences that follow for it. This is how he judges it. The birth of that, therefore, would awaken and beget intellect, truth, vision of reality, an overwhelming experience of beauty itself. Out of that, what must be developed? A different kind of thing, a curious kind of thing, excellence. And it has to be brought up. Well then, if it is, what happens? Well then, he would look to Homer and Hesiod and the other good poets and wish to rival them. Well, that is certainly a nice vision to have, right? And if you have nothing to do this weekend, I would suggest you do your utmost to try to get it. Now, going back. These are the steps. The vision, that's the challenge. It's a new beginning. And... It presupposes the arts of contemplation. It means, therefore, that you can include everything. You don't have to repress anything. Right? It's necessary to gather it up and bring it up into a vast pursuit, spiritual pursuit. Right? There is no split in man. And as he culminates it in this vision, he then awakens something magnificent called the intellect itself. That must be brought up, nurtured. And the result is that, as Socrates says, such a person becomes a friend of God and immortal if any man ever is. All right. I just wanted to run through that quickly for you so we could now throw it open and explore it. Yes? Um, is, he, is, is there a pan? I mean, one knowledge seems to be identical with knowledge of the one. Uh, no. Yes and no, but go ahead. Well, when, when you describe it, no, yeah. he, it is he's one getting the, the one knowledge, right. which when we look at it from here, yeah. is knowledge of the one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. is he... Quite true. Look. In the, in, the, in the world of Plato, you have this kind of structure. The one. 
Then you have intellect, pure intellect, hyphen, right? Because as you saw, with the arrival of intellect, you also necessarily must have seen the nature of reality, being. Right. In awaking the intellect, you recognize the nature of reality as being, and you're overwhelmed with the fact that what you're dealing with is something that has a vast and profound vitality. These are the three major terms that are used to describe the level of nous. This is the one. Then here we call this soul. Soul entering soul and body. Here, body without soul. Those are the five different levels. Now, if the nature of the one is described in the Parmenides as well as um, uh, in the Republic, right? it is that which is beyond all predicates. Transcends all predicates. Here, you can't have this vision without knowing you've encountered the nature of beauty. Would you agree with that? I mean, there's something marvelous about beauty, right? <laughs> it has one heck of an impact, and we know it when we experience it. Someone doesn't walk around saying, I wonder whether I experience beauty or not. They say, ah, if you wonder, you're, you're asleep, right? So these, these are things you can discover in the experience of beauty because in the experience of beauty, you recognize that uh, at simultaneously with the realization of beauty that you used the mind and the mind alone can see it. So these are connected. When you recognize that the beauty that you encountered is the nature of reality, then you're seeing into that experience of beauty all the qualities we just put over there, did we not? Everlasting, neither this, neither that, right? All the negatives, right? But I mean, the way we yeah. discuss it is through the negatives, which is beyond all predicates. Well, but would you not agree one predicate we can't get away from? Beauty. Second, everlasting. Three, permeates all. Is, those, those are predicates. One? Those are predicates. Well, it permeates all. Everlasting is from neither born nor perishing. I mean, he doesn't say everlasting. He just says what it's not. Okay, look at. Let me see if I can help you with this. All right. Okay, we try. We have a little fun. Okay, here we go. Um, two words. All right. Distinctions. Right. We can make distinctions without, without making divisions or finding parts. Would you agree with that? Like, here's the top, here's the bottom. If I hold it this way, of course if I hold it that way, then this becomes the top that comes I can make distinctions without breaking it into parts. Right. But if I can make distinctions, then I am dealing with something that you can distinguish Right, you can distinguish it. Now, try this for a moment in an, an abbreviated form. If we want to talk about the one in itself, right, the one then clearly we do not want to talk about the many, do we? So if we are talking about the one, and if our dialogue necessarily involves us in making distinctions that are appropriate from the many, we'll know we're not in the one, but we're in the many, and we better get out of the many and get back in the one. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's the case, do you think it's likely then that the one can be a whole? Well, wait a minute, the whole must necessarily have parts. The parts would be making distinctions. That would be a many, would it not? Therefore, we can't call the one a whole, can we? Right. right, right. By the way, we can't say it's a part, can we? Because that presupposes a whole of which is parts. It would still be a many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's nearly a whole, nor a part. Yeah. By the way, do you think you can have a beginning, middle, or end? No, because they would be the distinctions. If it doesn't have a beginning, middle, or end, would you not agree? One thing we're not going to be able to do, and that is describe it as a uh, circle or as a straight line for those things have beginning, middles, and ends necessarily. Agree? Would you not agree then, in general, if it has any form whatsoever, any form is merely a consequence of applying different straight lines and circles to whatever it is. Therefore, it must be without form, the formless. Agree? Right? Yeah, well, if it's formless, having no beginning, middle, or end, then I wonder whether we can relate it in any way to anything. Look here, is it possible that we might be able to talk about it as the same as anything else? Ah, because if we did, there'd be something else if we'd compare it and we're in a manyness and we're not in a one. All right. Can we talk about it as being other than everything else? No, because other presupposes other things. You can't talk about it being other than that either. Right, 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 right. Well, if it's not the same as the self or other, could it be other than another? It couldn't be other than another because that would be <laughs> other than another thing. You're making contrast with it and finding differences in it that are distinctions, and we said we wouldn't allow that, so that we can't do that either. Hmm. Hmm. Well, then, let's see. It can't be the same, can't be other, can't be... Uh, other than another or another. It can't be another either, can it? No, no, no. Well, then look here. Is it possible that we may be able to talk about it as being in, in space? Because if it's in space, it requires two things, right, right. But we could say, could, or could we say it's in time? Ah. Well, therefore, it's not in space, it's not in time, right? No space, no time. Um, but could it, be moved? could it be moved? Certainly, if it can move from one place to the other, it'd have to be different places in which it can move, and that would be a manyness. So it can't be moved, it can't be in motion, can't be in space, can't be in time. Huh. But wait a minute, could it be just, just where it is and rotating upon a point? And therefore be in one place, but yet in motion? No, because then there'd have to be different places around which it turns, and that would be many distinctions, right? Do you think it could be in itself? Think it, the one could be in itself? If it were in itself, that would be part of it that would be in it, another part would be outside of it, and certain parts would be, have to be different from itself in order for it to be in itself. So it can't be in itself either, can it? But can I say what it can be? Well, I hope so. I was just going to kind of run through a bunch of stuff so that we you can... You told me those things it can be. Go ahead. Now tell me what it could be, without me. making distinctions. What? Be. It can be. I think you might be right, but wait a minute. Right? Are not many things, uh, don't they have being without being the one? Yeah. Oh, well, then it's a property that other things have as well as the one. Yeah. Well, then it's a distinction of the one. It isn't the one. Yeah, no, okay. You have, you have to say it again slowly. Yeah, sure, sure. If being and the one were the same thing, then when anything... No, not that being and the one are the same thing. Good. It, it, well, to be is to have existence, is it not? Yes. Well, to have existence, you can use it in two ways, can you not? Something then that comes into being and passes out of being, that's one form of existence, or be in the sense of being, it always is there. And it right. pre yeah. just is. Just is, yeah, just right, is. right. Would you agree some things can be said to be or to be is without being the one? Mm, no. One, the one is the only thing that can be said to be? In this, in this sense in, of being, in this sen sense that it is changeless, etc. yeah. Okay, then it's the, it's the only term we can use with the one so far. Is yeah. that correct? Right. So do you it's mean... Absolute this, pure being. If it's absolute and pure being, then there must be something about it that's pure. To 
distinction. Uh, does the one have being? Well, the one is being. Is being. Oh, the one is is. Right? Uh, is being. <laughs> I, I want to keep with the chair. All right, all right, all right, all right. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, yeah, 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 you're right. Well, okay, see? Then, we're now saying, are we not? These are equivalent. Is that where we are? And furthermore, is, there's is only ness. one thing. Rather than is, isness or being. Isness or being. Yeah. And it's the only thing that has it. Right? That's the only thing that has it, you said? For if other things have it, then it's a quality of other things as well as itself. What's over there? If, if other things have the quality of red, as well as my having something red, then there's something I have that is red that is not exclusive to me since other things can have red. Therefore, it must be a quality of other things that I also can have, and therefore, it's a quality. Do you reason that way? Then would have the quality of being. And therefore it wouldn't be one because it would be something about it. That other than it's other than one. Well, if it has a quality right. in it. And that would be making a, a, a distinction. distinction. And we don't want to do that because we want just a pure one. We don't want to end up with a many. So yes, help, are we help. approaching the denegativo of that about which nothing can be said? We're kind of bumping into it, yes. Yeah, I mean, are we getting to a point where the only thing you say is the one is the one? Or worse. <laughs> it's not even that. Worse. <laughs> We're going to have to die that, that it can be called one. Okay, what happens if we say the one is the one? Then let's go from <laughs> the one is the one. Well. You see, if there, is, if there is this, right, and we can call it one, then we're making a distinction about it. And therefore, we shouldn't even call it one, or we're adding to it a name, and therefore there's two things, the thing and the thing we call it. Therefore, there's a difference between the one and the thing you call it. Ah, distinction. Can't have that. Can we have a finger? Can you point to it? Yes. Can, can you have the finger pointing to the moon? Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Because, I mean, Lao yeah. Tzu already says the Tao or the mm -hmm. one which can be named is not mm -hmm. the Tao. So yeah, that's right. we that's agree right. with that. That's right. That's, that's right. That's right. Yes, we're doing that with this, with a dialectic. Yes, this is the Tao that cannot be named. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, going back, though, see, would you not agree from what we've said, though, that intellect, being, and vitality, and beauty can be said about this experience. The wonderful fingers. Oh yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> I am among those I am I am among those who applaud it. Right. So therefore you can have the one and you can have one knowledge. You can also have one soul, world soul. Right? So there's different uses of the idea of one through the system. Yeah. yeah. Yes? A private <laughs> giggle is allowed. Um, what I'd like to see is some type of demonstration about how you had a few terms up there from the speech earlier about uh, never being born, never perishing. Right. Uh, the word truth. No beginning, middle, or end. Right. Uh, I don't think that the next phrase I'm pulling comes from this speech, but I can't remember where it comes from, but it can never said to come to be from yes. nothing. It cannot, it cannot come into existence from or nothing. pass out of existence. Um, mm -hmm. 
when you deal with analogy, oh. and what I'd like to see is a demonstration of the relation between truth of with respect to the state of mind when you realize that the relations, the terms may vary, but the relations are constant. Because if the relations are constant, hmm. how can those ever said to come to be or pass out of existence? The idea of uh, relations being constant, though the terms may vary, mm -hmm. right, is something, therefore, that you can apply terms to, necessarily. And it must have, as you just mentioned, it must have relations among them. So therefore, it has to be below this. So, right, it has to be below that. Um, the idea of truth in, in Plato is quite interesting. Um, it takes on two meanings. If one, if one has uh, had this vision, then one knows the nature of reality. Okay? If you know the nature of reality, then whatever you say about it that's consistent with that would be truth. Because the, the things that you're going to attribute it, to it, if in fact your reasoning is sound, they will all be truths. Therefore, the truth of reality is what you can say about the nature of reality. Therefore, another way of putting it, which I think is even better, uh, in the idea of truth is also uh, not forgetting. Uh, see, if one has this experience of reality, it's impossible to forget it. Right? It's something not, forget not forgettable. You can't forget it. Uh, you pass through the river of Leith, right? There, there's no forgetting it. You can't forget it. The word truth in Greek, aletheia, it means not forgetting. But another side to it is um, um, the idea of integrity. Right? Everyone wants to know whether or not this existence of ours has any, any reality, and what we mean by reality should be, whether or not it's meaningful, whether there's some significance to it, whether it's worthwhile, whether we're here for some purpose, whether, it, whether uh, we can gaze upon, let us say, the experience of beauty in itself and see the, in that experience that life is worth living. We want to see whether life is worth living. You can only get that with the experience of ultimate reality. Therefore, the person who can say in that experience, life is worthwhile because the existence of beauty and the experience of beauty itself, that's truth. That's true. Why? Because it necessarily follows from the experience of beauty, the nature of reality being such as it is, you would be then making a truth. Therefore, reality and truth are always together. Let me go again. The things, the things that you perceive directly from the experience of reality has to be what you can say is true. The, those things that you can say about it which are true is that it, it is the source of all value. That's true. Now, did I cover what you're saying? Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah, okay, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Sir? Um, if we were to take ten other philosophers and have them give this particular uh, analysis of the supposed, how, how close say um, I must tell you that I, I don't read uh, other philosophers <laughs> except at work uh, that was a joke uh, let me answer you more fully um, I have not read anyone in western philosophy any major thinker who deals with this 
Heidegger, who's now going, Hegel and Heidegger, uh, they're going back to this idea of being, but they don't understand it this way. So you're absolutely correct. My comments, I hope, can be found and can be traced to everything in the text itself. Now the modern rendering of being is, does not have any of those. And in that sense, you're quite right. It's that is to say, they wouldn't agree with it because they don't think that's what being is. The basic difference between European philosophy and classic philosophy hangs on this one word, being. It's as if Europeans don't understand the nature of being in Platonic thought and the Platonic tradition. Now, this is not just... Um, the symposium, it's the Republic. You can see the same thing, especially in, in Plotinus. You can see it in Porphyry. You can see it in Proclus. See it in Iamblichus. So this is representing a Platonic tradition. For some strange reason, and I want to assure you, I haven't got the faintest idea why it's the case, Europeans do not deal with this. That is to say, modern philosophers do not deal with this. Pardon? I don't... Modern they don't. But I mean, do they talk? They have Heidegger and Hegel and talk about being. They talk about being in time. This is timeless by definition. This is out of time and space. Matter of fact, his, his great work is being in time. And uh, uh, Sartre as well. Um, talking about not a Western philosopher, but an Eastern philosopher, mm -hmm. even though he doesn't. At least so I'm thinking of Rumi. Oh, Even Rumi. Oh, yes. Rumi is oh, here. So it was a Neoplatonist. Oh, yes. But oh, yes. his conception of being is oh, identical. Yes. Oh, yes. Quite true. Yeah. yeah. Sawardi and Rumi. Yes. Oh, yes. And it's also consistent with Hindu thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's Lao Tzu about the one and the other. Lao Tzu? Others. Yeah. We'll put him in there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 See, the question we're running around, the, the, the interesting question. It's a question that's on the, uh, on the net, on the wide world, the web. And there's a Plato group on the net. And the one question, the major ba basic question, which will always come sooner or later, is in what class do you place this thinker called Socrates and Plato? What other members are in his class? Because, you see, uh, the, the kind of philosopher that talks this way is not a modern European philosopher. It's as if the word itself has changed remarkably. This, I think, as you were mentioning, is quite right. Lao Tzu, Buddhism, um, the Upanishads. In other words, this is a vision of Plato that belongs in a religious tradition of which they are members. And uh, that's the kinds of people who should be compared against and not with Heidegger and, and Schopenhauer and, and uh, Leibniz and etc. That's... But I'm willing to entertain any notion of it, though. Yeah, I have a different... Yeah. If you go... Um, if you put the charts... Yeah. Where we have... We have two, uh, um, no, I think it's... Sorry, backwards. Yeah, we could, I think we could stop, no, the previous page. That's the first. Okay, in one of them, when we have the team, uh, Oh, yes. That beautiful picture of the team. Right, okay. This is the definition of philosophical midwifery. Yes. Oh, yes. The language is all midwifery. Begetting, begetting, helping beget, bringing to birth, make care, nurturing, growth. Yes, oh, yes. And, and Socrates the, calls himself. Right, that's a function of the teacher yeah. and the student. And mm -hmm. We have the child, and that's mm -hmm. a function of philosophy. Yes, oh yes. 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 That's perhaps why the modern uh, movement in philosophical counseling may promise to be a return to the ancient sooner or later. Yes. Is the Plato saying that the ultimate reality is beauty? The ultimate reality, no, ultimate reality when experienced in that the experience is beautiful. But he doesn't say what the ultimate reality is. Being. Being. Uh, okay, right. right. 
So uh, the effect it has on you is, wow! <laughs> yeah? Wow, that's magnificent, you know? Hey, by the way, what was it you experienced? I don't know, it had these qualities. What qualities? Well, there's no end to it? Uh, no up and down? Uh, fantastic in, in respect to no differences anywhere? It's beyond all space and time? Put all those words together, you say, oh, I know what you mean, being. So the, the, that's a conclusion from what can be asserted about the nature of the experience. Another question. Um, you, you haven't said much about love this evening, although the symposium oh. has to do with the nature of love. Where does that fit in? If anyone sees the beautiful, in anything they find, it arouses a desire for it. And therefore, what's magnificent about this, you see right from the beginning of the dialogue, is that if this is once perceived, then you'll do anything you can to get back to it and dive into it again and again because it will awaken a terrible love. Matter of fact, in the Phaedrus, that's what he describes it. He says, hey, you know what? Mankind has been spared. Really, man has been spared a, a, a great misery. And he has it this way, because if, if wisdom could be seen with the human eye, it would arouse a terrible love. And you do anything and everything to pursue it. He says, we're saved. So in that sense, wisdom and, and uh, beauty are one. Can I have the third B word since we've got beautiful tonight and being? I want to add bliss. Another description of the feeling that you get mm -hmm. when you get in touch with reality. Mm -hmm. uh, say it again, maybe I missed your point. We use the word beautiful yes. and being. Be I want to just add another word. Yes. Bliss. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's just another B word. Oh, yes. Another B word. Yeah, bliss. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bliss, bountiful, all of the great terms. You're quite right. Come down the hierarchy a little bit. Um, seems like Plotinus, I read on his work on the good and the one, yeah. that soul creates the physical universe. Soul what? Soul creates body. Soul creates the physical. Maybe, maybe I read it wrong. It seemed like he distinctly said that soul produces out of itself the physical. And you were speaking about... Soul seeks that upon which it can emerge. See, it, it's a descent. In Plotinus, it's the, it's the... We are ensouled. Anything living is ensouled. That is to say, the soul enters it and brings with it its life <clears throat> and its purpose. But what you're saying is it creates it. I, if you have that quote, I'd like to see it because I, I don't know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean we're in soul versus being embodied? It's what do you mean by soul being and soul? In soul versus being embodied. Uh, I mean oh, oh no. Yeah. When it is in soul, it is embodied. Yes. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it, but is the relationship with intellect to soul similar to that as soul is to body? That is, that when intellect enters soul, there's a certain effect? Uh, yes, there certainly is. Uh, this actually should be written this way, to, to be more correct. Um, so therefore you have that participation this has a participation model to it this does not this is stratified so here if that's intellect then there is a part of soul which necessarily has intellect shares and participates in it or you could talk about it in which intellect descends yeah yeah, 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 yeah. 
Um, for Latinos. Four versus five. Pardon me, four or five. Is there any reason you drew four of these circles rather than the five levels? Oh, I always leave that out. Ah, okay. I, I didn't, no reason. I, I was at just all. hoping you. No were reason leaving. at all. I was, I was hoping that you were li leaving the one out. No, oh, thank that's you. That's <laughs> <me. laughs> no. <laughs> That we must always be careful not to do. You should leave the one out of the participation model. In the sense that it should be separate up, up above, it shouldn't have. No, that's true. That's what? true. What you're saying is the degree to which the one, therefore, can be said of other things means that other things must share in it. Right. You're moving, therefore, from uh, this step, the step you're making is Proclus. Right? right? That's, that's what Proclus contributes. He says that part of which one and intellect share is called oneness. Why the henas? What do you call the henas? Imminent one. Pardon? The imminent one. The imminent one. Yeah, and a, a, a oneness. Well, when you say so far, you've been talking about Socrates' contribution to this dialogue. There were a few other speakers who also had things to say. Is there anything of importance in what they have to say? Or and if not, why are they there? Oh. You're talking now about a great subject, <clears throat> which is true for every dialogue. And that is, uh, it, sometimes it takes this form. What is the architecture of the dialogue? Right? So the dialogue, the dialogue itself is situated where people are already present before Socrates gets there sitting in a circle and each one is required to give a full dress oration and praise of love. Right? And uh, the rule is that anyone who gives a really good speech, that will be enough and the next person doesn't have to speak. And therefore, if the second person speaks, he thinks he can improve on his predecessor. And therefore, Socrates, who's the last speaker, if, he, if he's going to give a speech in principle, he should then have a, a correcting, right? It should be a, a a remedial or a, a correcting device for all the other speeches. Um, now, there's another speech that comes later, Alcibiades, which is extremely important. Uh, but I think you're asking about how do you understand the architecture of the dialogue? Why are they other speeches? Why couldn't he have just given the speech of Diotima as a separate and, and uh, in different length? Um, <clears throat> Each one of these speeches is taking a major theme, which is true in Socrates' speech, but they understand it on a lower level. And the easiest one to give is uh, Aristophanes, that man is a unity, that there's a, uh, a primordial division, that man seeks a whole, that man seeks a unity, that man seeks some way of bringing himself together into a unity, into a oneness. That's what Socrates is doing. But he understands it physically until you get to the end of his speech, and therefore he understands it on another level at the end of his own speech, where he says, uh, you know, the real way to make the human race happy, he said, of course, there's only one way, uh, find a lover who suits your own mind, forget the body. <laughs> of course, that, that demolishes his whole thesis and the beautiful speech that he gave. A fun speech. I enjoyed it very much. Now, let me go back to your question with one point now. All right? In every speech, uh, let me, in every speech and in every dialogue that Socrates is involved in, there is always a drum, drama, a dramatic play between appearance and reality. Always. They give the appearance and all the ways in which it can be misunderstood, he gives the reality. And therefore, in the end of the dialogue, he has that wonderful uh, dialogue between Agathon, Aristophanes, and himself as they're passing the wine, and that's tragedy, comedy, and the philosopher. And that's the big question for philosophy, isn't it? You know, is, is the nature of our reality a tragic comicality? 
<laughs> or not, you know. Or does philosophy have a sufficient vision to see behind the tragic comicality of everyday life something profound? Because, uh, as you know, Aristophanes can only be comic in respect to the fact that there can't be any basis for meaning or significance. I went on and said too much. I, I hope I didn't. Uh, well, if you, if you still have a piece of it, bring it back. Uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me share this with you. I always enjoy it. Thank you.